Wow, good morning. Good morning. Good morning and welcome to Subscribe 2012. I'm Brian Bell. I'm the CMO of Zora and I'm thrilled to be the first to welcome you to the industry event of the year for the subscription economy. This is um, incredible. Look at this room. How many of you were here last year? We had a customer day about a year ago. Just show, show of hands. All right, so really just uh, relatively few. It was a much smaller event. This year, we had over 1,000 registered attendees for this event, 1,000 registered attendees. And we have, at least we estimate, about 1,000 more watching live um, in real-time streaming on Ustream. And, uh, and I'm, I'm proud to say that Ustream is also a customer of ours. So um, very excited to have many of you viewing live um, on, on, uh, on your computers at home or at work. The, this is, um, wh why is this so big? Well, this is really an event for the industry. This is an event for the industry. It's for partners, it's for analysts, it's for customers, it's for the media, it's for anyone and any, everyone who wants to be a part of the subscription economy. Anyone and everyone who wants to be a part of the subscription economy. So, and not only, not only is it in this room, we're taking this on the road. In fact, we, we encourage you to join us because we're gonna take this Subscribe 2012 event around the world. We're taking it in just a few short weeks to the UK. So we'll be giving this event in October in London. And then we're gonna be in Sydney, Australia in November. So it's a global, a global event. So why, why is there so much interest? Well, there's so much interest because the subscription economy is the future. And we believe the future is happening now. You see it, we see it, our customers are demanding it. We're responding to it. The thousand of you here, those watching at home or in work, are part of that response. And it's real, and it's alive. So, so why are we holding an event? Well, we're holding an event because many of you recognize, as we do, that this is a fundamentally different business model. That the subscription economy is fundamentally different and it requires a different set of best practices, a different set of understanding and strategies, a different set of processes, a different set of metrics to make the subscription economy and the subscription businesses hum. And you told us that you want to create a community. And that's what we're trying to do here today. It's to create a community of people to come together to share best practices, to, to, share, to share strategies about their growth and how they're driving their growth uh, businesses, to share uh, processes and what are the best practices in driving operational efficiencies in, in subscription business processes, and to share uh, an understanding of how they're using data to make better business, business decisions. That's why we're here today. So who, who are all of you? Well, there's some interesting statistics. Most of you are in IT or technology. But about a third of you come from finance and are struggling with trying to make sense of some of the financial implications of the subscription business model. And a third of you also are VP or senior level executives, which to us is a sign that the subscription model, the subscription economy, has really become a topic in the C-suite, in the boardrooms, um, where they're having discussions about how do we take advantage of this new business model and grow our businesses and businesses of all, of all different sizes. In fact, most of you represent what we would call growth businesses, businesses that were really designed around this model of a subscription. But many of you, in fact, about 300 of the registered attendees here today, um, represent enterprises of $100 million or more. And that's a fundamental shift from where we were 12 or 18 months ago. This conversation has really made its way into the enterprise where we have companies responding and reacting and trying to find avenues of competitive advantage, avenues of growth by embracing the subscription business model. And that's what the opportunity here is for, for you today. Today we're creating that environment and so we invite all of you to take advantage of what we put together today. You're gonna hear some keynotes, you're gonna see product demonstrations about what we're doing uh, at Zora to, to, to help you automate and drive growth in your businesses. But you'll have networking opportunities at lunch. You get an opportunity to meet the product managers. And then in the afternoon, we have a whole set of breakout sessions where really they're, they're all driven by, by existing customers to share their best practices about what, what they've learned, what they've achieved, 
and hopefully um, foster that learning and that sharing across the community. So I encourage all of you to take advantage of these opportunities to learn, to share, and to network. So with that, I have um, the pleasure to introduce a true visionary in our industry. Um, and I, I vividly remember the first time I met Teen. Uh, it was about, just about a year ago. Uh, we we uh, were introduced uh, through someone and, and we agreed to meet in the Sofitel in Redwood City. It was one of those classically sort of foggy days. And we met in the lobby of the Sofitel. And at that time, I was running um, uh, a $500 million business at CA. And I was undergoing in, in that role a major transformation, a, a transformation that many of you um, may relate to and may be experiencing today. It, we were the leading on-premise software application, and we were under threat. We had competitors that were trying to get into our space, and they had been purpose-built around the subscription business model and SaaS model. And we knew what we needed to do. Strategically, we knew, we knew we needed to move through the cloud. We knew technologically what we had to do. We had to make some changes to our, to our product and portfolio. But we completely underestimated the impact uh, of the business model and how dramatically different it would be and what was required to really be successful as we made that transition. And when I met Teen that morning, he shared with me his vision. He shared with me his vision about the subscription economy. And, and, and it was clear that, that he, was, he was speaking and, and articulating the problems that I was facing at that time. That, that the world needs a new business system to manage subscription businesses. Um, and, and that was incredibly, incredibly powerful. So I, I, with no further ado, I'd like to introduce the spiritual leader of the subscription economy, the CEO and the co-founder of Zora, Tienzo. Teen. Thanks, Brian. Thank you, Brian. Good morning and welcome. Welcome, welcome, welcome to Subscribe 2012, our second annual conference. It's, um, we've got a lot of great announcements today that I'm really, really excited to share with you. But first, first, I would like to take us back one year. I would like to take us back one year to our first inaugural conference where we unveiled a bold vision, our bold vision, of where our industry was going. And it was at that conference that we made a claim. We made a claim that you and I would find ourselves buying less and less stuff. And instead, we find ourselves subscribing to more and more services to meet our, every, our, our, our needs. And we came up with a term, we coined a term called the subscription economy to describe the shift away from buying products to subscribing to services. And last year we talked about why. Why was the world moving towards a subscription economy? We talked about, well, certainly technology was bringing us there, right? That now that we live in a world with a ubiquitous internet, you know, ubiquitous network, an advanced logistical system that can really track and move any physical good from one location to another, it made much, much more sense now to create brand new innovations as a service in the cloud for our customers to access over their mobile devices anytime, anywhere. We talked about how, how customers, our customers are starting to demand services, that, that consumers and businesses alike, once you get a taste for something as a service, once you, 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 you remove the shackles of ownership, the shackles of property ownership, and you get a taste of it, you want more and more of it. Once you try out Salesforce.com, once you use it, there's really no going back to, to, to traditional on-premise enterprise software. We talked about how the business model was much better. When you're running these businesses, you realize that there's a reward for building customer loyalty that comes in predictable business models, predictable cash flows that gives you a much, much better way to plan your business. We talked about how the smart money was really realizing this, right? Whether it's Sand Hill Road or Wall Street, the smart money was starting to realize that this is a better business model and they were placing a price premium, a premium value on subscription-based businesses as composed to their traditional, traditional counterparts. We talked about how the subscription economy actually implied more efficient use of resources, right? That in this day and age, as, as product life cycles shrink from decades to years to months to even weeks, it makes no sense for each of us to own one copy of everything, only to have it sit idle 92% of the time, right? The world is going, requires us to have more sharing, more sufficient, efficient use of resources, and a subscription economy was one way, really, to get us there. But we talked about how it was a lot more than that. 
it was a lot more than just a shift in how we consume products to, to, to services, but it was a fundamental transformation in how businesses think about their business, how companies think about their business. And that it was no longer about thinking about your business as shipping product, creating product, and trying to get as many units of products out there in the marketplace as possible, but instead it was about customers. It was about customers, it was about building relationships with customers and finding ways to monetize those valuable relationships. And with this change of focus, we talked about how fundamentally different these business models were. That when you shift away your focus from the product to the customers, right, big, big transformations happen. Instead of thinking about your business as selling units, you look at monetizing valuable relationships, building and monetizing valuable relationships. The pricing was different. Instead of pricing your products on a per unit basis, you had to come with pay-as-you-go pricing plans that met your customer needs and met their desires. And instead of one-time orders, now orders were in the context of a customer, in the context of the life cycle of a customer from cradle to grave. That in the old world, you had to pick a segment. You had to pick a segment, you had to say, I'm selling to large businesses, I'm selling to small businesses, I'm selling to consumers. But when it's just a service in the cloud, it's not B2B, it's not B2C, it's B to any. You can actually service any person regardless of whether they're representing a company or representing themselves. We talked about how the financial metrics are completely different, right? That you cared about churn, you cared about new renewal rates, you care about new concepts like monthly recurring revenue and how these metrics were completely different. And we talked about last year about how this difference, this difference in how you run a business implied your existing systems are becoming fast obsolete. And it was last year, one year ago, at our first user conference, where we got up here and we predicted that as the world shifts to a subscription economy, that your existing systems, these ERP systems, are fast becoming obsolete, and we predicted the eventual death of SAP and Oracle. Now that was <laughs> one year ago. That was one year ago, and a lot has happened in this last year. A lot has happened this last year. In this last year, we've seen industry after industry shift over to the subscription economy. We've seen the media industry shift. As companies like News International have woken up and realized, you know, these people that consume our content, they are our customers. They're just not a demographic for us to sell advertising to, but they're actually our customers. And a year ago, News International actually, across their four newspapers in London, they outsourced the customer management. They outsourced for each different title. It was a different vendor per title. They outsourced the billing, the payment, the subscriber management, all to a different company. They called it circulation. And in the last year, the News International said, this doesn't make any sense. We're going to bring it all in-house. We're going to build a single customer database. We're going to track the preferred payment methods across all our customers, whether it's credit cards or a UK direct debit account. And that allows us to build relationships with our customers. It allows us to cross-sell and upsell customers from one title to the next. That allows us to build bundles that span web and, 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 and print and mobile devices. And that allows us to do innovative things. And so today, if you look at News International, they're actually using Twitter with their journal journalists, with a big following, to actually drive customer subscribers, customer acquisition, subscriber acquisition. They are now able to find new ways, innovative ways to build customer relationships. In the last year, we've seen the technology industry shift. And you can hear more about this later today. Right? It started with software and the shift to SaaS. And then you saw cloud computing and cloud storage. And today, the biggest technology company on the face of this planet, Hewlett Packard, is moving fast and furiously into the subscription economy. And we're proud to say that we're working with nine different divisions of HP to launch public cloud services, to launch SaaS services, to launch printer services. There's even a service where, for do-it-yourself magazines where you can upload your content. It's called HP Mag or Mag Cloud, and it'll actually print out all these magazines and, and send it to, 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 to your readership. Really, really exciting stuff. In the last year, we see the telecom industry wake up and realize that they are not just competing with the telco down the street or the cable company down the street. They're actually now competing with Google. They're competing with Netflix. They're competing with Apple. Apple's trying to siphon all their customers away and siphon the customer relationships away. And they're saying, we need to be much more fast, move much faster. We need to be a lot more nimble. So when a bunch of executives from Rogers, the second largest telecom company in Canada, decided to peel off and start a brand new telco, targeting the 13 million rural subscribers, underserved subscribers in Canada, they said, we're not going to go with a traditional telecom billing infrastructure. We're going to go with a brand new cloud infrastructure, cloud billing, cloud CRM. This is what we need to really compete in the future. In the last year, we've actually seen the retail industry make the shift. And today, you can walk into a Lowe's and you can buy a box. You can buy a physical box, you can bring it home, plug it into your home network, and it automatically starts to detect all the different devices in your house. The thermostat, the lights, different appliances, and you can actually take out your iPhone and iPad and control your house directly from a device. 
And you can buy this at Lowe's as a subscription service. Why is that? Well, because Lowe's realized that their customer relationships today end at the checkout counter. You go, you get your hammers, you get your screwdrivers, you get your drywall, you put it in a cart, you buy it, you leave, and your relationship ends. And what they're thinking is, you know, if we can build a relationship with our customers that's an ongoing relationship and provide services and learn a little bit about our customers as a result of that and build tighter relationships, perhaps they will be less inclined to walk down, to go to Home Depot that opened in the last six months closer to their house, and they'll continue to, to, to be a Lowe's customer on an ongoing basis. In the last year, we've seen subscription services crop up for virtually all sorts of needs, right, from coffee to chocolate to teas, to handbags, to kids' toys, to underwear, even here the Dollar Rubber Club, even for, for prophylactic protection. You can buy that now as a service. There's actually three companies right now competing for that space. And if you don't subscribe to that, well, I'm here to recommend another service called Kiwi Crate up there on the top right. It's a service my three-year-old uses. She's actually a member of the subscription economy. Every month, she gets a green box that comes in the mail. She gets all excited. She opens it. It's an Arches of Crafts, and you know, it's nice. It's daddy-daughter time for the next month, creating a safari or cars or pinwheels. And my daughter is actually part of the subscription economy. In the last year, we've seen Business Week write about this trend. They said in an article called Making the Web Subscription Economy Hum, as web businesses embrace the subscription-based business models, the benefits are clear. Reduce customer acquisition costs, steady cash flow. Gartner predicts that by 2015, more than 40% of media and digital products will be sold as a subscription service. The Wall Street Journal wrote an article saying the new realities of our increasingly mobile economy, and they call it a transition from the ownership society to what they call a rentership society, or the subscription economy. And instead of being a drag on the economy, Instead of, you know, instead of having dollars spread out and having a drag, they actually think that it will unleash a wave of economic efficiency that might even cure our current economic doldrums. The Washington Post said, you know, this consumerism is being redefined for the mobile age. And this whole thing about not buying, right, there's an article in the Atlantic Post called The Cheapest Generation, the millennials aren't buying anything, they're not buying cars, they're not buying houses, right? But the Washington Post says, you know, this is not just a trend limited to the young guys. Professionals and families are starting to adopt this in ways that weren't even predicted by the venture capitalists. And finally, the New York Times says, the CEOs are beginning to appreciate the value of recurring revenue. It started software, the software company adopted, but now we're seeing it spreading, and we're seeing companies in every industry start to embrace this idea. When you see these articles from the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, when every major publication writes about the, about the shift to the subscription economy, you know that it's happening. And so one year later, since we've announced it, we believe that we are standing here at the tipping point of the subscription economy. We believe what we predicted a year ago is starting to come true, and we are standing here at the tipping point of the subscription economy. And there's no better proof of that than the people in this room, our customer base, the Zora community. Right, from startups launching their first products, like Cloud Passage or GoGrid or Lemon, from some of the fastest growing private companies that are around today, like Box.net and DocuSign and InsideView, right, from newly minted public companies like Splunk and Jive, to some of the biggest companies in the world, like Hewlett Packard, like Tata, like, the New York, like, 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 like News Corp with the Times, and with Lowe's. You guys are the proof point that we are stand here, we're standing here at the tipping point of the subscription economy. We can see this. We can see this. Your success in your business is powering our growth. And if you look at our growth in the last four years, your success has made us one of the fastest growing SaaS companies here today over the last four years. Your success, we can see it in our servers. We can see it in the transaction volume. Your success is flowing through our servers, and we've had 3x transaction volume growth in the last year alone. And this year, we're on target to grow another 8x or 10x in our transaction volume. In fact, if you look at our entire customer base and you add up their businesses, it represents $12 billion today of contracted total invoice volume. That's $12 billion which has been shifted over to the subscription economy over the last four years. In response, we've been expanding. We've been growing. We raised a little money at the end of last year. We've hired upwards of 100 people. And we've opened offices in London. We've opened offices in Sydney. We opened offices in Atlanta. Soon to open another office in Chicago. And we're expanding around the world really to meet your needs. We've invested a lot in support. We've doubled our support staff. We've added 10, upwards of 10 customer success managers, account managers, if you will, right, to really meet your needs. We've expanded our coverage to 24 by 5 
for all business issues and 24 by 7 for mission critical issues. We've narrowed down our target response time to 15 minutes. And we're proud to report here that in the last year, we've achieved 95% customer satisfaction rate as reported by Zendesk, who's here today as a customer, right? And that compares to an 86% benchmark across their benchmark of 15,000 or so companies. Something we're really proud of. Congratulations to our customer support and success team. We spent upwards of $6 million to open two brand new data centers, one in Las Vegas and one here in the Bay Area, to back each other up. And today we have probably 20x more capacity than we used to. But we, more importantly, we have an architecture now that as we add boxes, it allows us to scale, we believe, for the next 10, 15, and 20 years. We've invested over 60 man years in R&D to release a lot of new cool features across billing, commerce, and finance, which you're gonna hear more about today, and committed to our monthly release of innovations on, on, a, on a monthly single basis. Why are we doing this? Well, we believe, we believe in you. We believe in your success. If we're standing here at the tipping point of the subscription economy, if the shift to the subscription economy is going to happen, your success, your growth is guaranteed, and we want to be there for you, and that's why we've invested really in the expansion over the last year. And we're only just getting started. Today, today we have two major announcements that we would like to share with you. Two brand new announcements. Our first announcement, our first announcement starts 500 years ago. 500 years ago with this man, Luca Bartolomeo Pacioli, a good mama's boy from Bensonhurst. And who is Mr. Pacioli? Well, he is the inventor of the double entry bookkeeping system. He did this in the 1500s. He was actually a friend of Leonardo da Vinci, a mathematician. And he came up with this whole idea of double entry bookkeeping, this whole idea of debits and credits always being in balance, right? That you got to add to the asset side and add to the liability side or subtract from the asset side and subtract from the liability side or add and subtract both sides. I can never figure out which is debit, which is credit. That's me. But you know, that's basically how it works. Double entry bookkeeping. Double entry bookkeeping has been the same from the, the, the merchants of Venice all the way to the modern CFO, Dylan Smith, CFO of Box, the modern CFO, college dropout, 26 years old, millionaire bachelor, founder of a company. That is the modern CFO. But double entry accounting system <laughs> has served our modern society, our whole financial infrastructure from the accountants to the auditors to the finance department to Wall Street, to the 10Ks, to SECs, to the IPOs, to price earning ratios, it's all built on this system. It's all built on the double entry system. It's served us well for 500 years until now. Something happened. Something called the subscription economy happened. And it's breaking double entry bookkeeping. It's breaking the traditional foundation of finance. How? Well, you run these businesses. You run subscription economy business. You know, and I know, that if a friend comes to you and says, I'll give you $100 a year for the next eight years. And a second friend comes to you and says, I'll give you $100. Well, you know, the first friend, that $100 over eight years is a lot more valuable than $100. Heck, it's more valuable than $200 right now. It's more valuable than $300 right now. You know that a stream of $100 is more valuable than a one-time thing. And you need to know that in your business. Because when you look at the dollars and cents of your business, it's important to you to differentiate between recurring and, 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 and one time. You want to match recurring profits and recurring expenses, get a sense of what your recurring profit is. That's really, really important. But if you look at your double entry bookkeeping systems, they don't really know. If you ask Signore Pacioli, what does he say? He says, uh, no, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a sorry, you know, I cannot handle this. You know, this, this one time, this recurring, you know, no capiche, no capiche. I don't know what this means. <laughs> or you want to spread this revenue over time, right? It used to be pretty simple. You sell a $30,000 order. It's got a bunch of products in it. You ship it. You recognize it. You invoice for it. You collect it. It's all one transaction. But now you've got these time-based things. You've got these services, right? They're paying $30,000 for a three-year contract, a one-year contract. You've got to spread all your stuff over time, right? And the accounting system, they don't know how to do that. Right? I mean, you ask, you know, Signora Pacioli, he says, well, you know, I could put the $30,000 into deferred revenue, right? But I can't move the stuff. I can't spread the stuff over time. I don't really know what to do. I can't build out a schedule. I can just tell you that you have $30,000 in deferred revenue. I can't tell you what happens to that $30,000. That's, uh, that's a your problem, right? <laughs> Grew up in Brooklyn. So, or... Your system doesn't know what to do with subscription change. Let's say you can actually take that $30,000 and let's say you spread it out. Your system actually allows you to spread it out. Well, then what happens? 
Well, then a customer comes back three months later and says, well, upgrade me from this, to this edition to this edition. Right, you know, I'm gonna go on vacation, could you spend to spend my home delivery? Well, you know, I want a credit, and for customer satisfaction, you offer them a $100 credit, a $10,000 credit, and all those things have to be spread out over time. And so you gotta take the original schedule and you gotta redo it. And at this point, you know, you're just giving Signora Pacioli a big headache. It just doesn't work. Double entry bookkeeping doesn't know how to handle any of these things. And so what's happening? What's happening in your businesses? Well, what we're finding is more and more of accounting, more and more of the finance department is seeping out of the accounting system, out of QuickBooks, out of NetSuite, out of Great Plains, into this phantom accounting system that we call Microsoft Excel, right? <laughs> that is what's happening. And so we go to your, you, you guys, our customers, we, we talk about billing, we talk about commerce, and you say, hey, could you come over here? Could you look at the spreadsheet I've got? Like, okay, let's take a look at it. And you open a spreadsheet, it's got like one row for every single customer, every single customer contract, right? So if you have 600,000 customer contracts, you have 600,000 rows. And it's got like one column for every month that you've been in business, right? So if you've been in business in five years, you've got 60, 72, 84 columns. I mean, it's just kind of crazy. It's just kind of crazy. More and more of your finance department is running off of spreadsheets. As a result, it's taking you longer and longer to close your books. We talk to customers and say, you know, at the end of the month, it's June 1st, we take two weeks to, to run the bills, to calculate all the bills and get them out, and then we take another two weeks to, to calculate revenue. And then we gotta close your books, and the next thing you know, it's six weeks, and you're running out of time. There's no place to catch up. You're running out of time in a month, and that's what's happening. We're also hearing that CFOs are maintaining two sets of books. Now, they don't like it when we say this. It sounds a little shady. We're not talking about like, you know, offshore accounts or tax authority. We're just talking about running your business. You got a set of books that you need, balance sheets, income statements, because you have to get, you know, your financial statements audited. But then you have a whole different set of metrics that you run your business on, right? Something with ARR, something with budgets, something with churn. It's a completely different spreadsheet that you run your business on, a completely different system, right? CMOs. CMOs have a problem. They have all these innovation that they want to do, all this packaging, pricing, new products we want to launch, right? And then what happens? You hit the CFO. You hit the CFO. This happened, I see some product managers here from Salesforce, you know this, right? In the old days, you go to Steve Cakebread, Steve Cakebread says, forget about it, you can't do it, right? You can't do it, my finance team is drowning, I can't support your new innovation. CEOs have a hard time explaining their success to the Wall Street. The most important statistic in Salesforce's 2011 annual report. The most important statistics that all of Wall Street is looking at is something, as a footnote, on page 11 called select off-balance sheet accounts. I mean, it's not even a balance sheet account. It's not on the balance sheet. It's not audited, right? It's not in the financial statements. And what is it? It was unbilled deferred revenue, right? Unbilled deferred revenue is approximately $2.2 billion. That's the metric that Wall Street cares about. It's not even in the financial statement. It's a non-GAAP statistic buried in a footnote. It doesn't make any sense. And as a result, you, you hear a lot of craziness. Right? You hear a lot of craziness about, well, you know, Salesforce's price earning ratios was 666 yesterday, right? Sign of the devil. I mean, that's what these things say, and it doesn't make any sense, and it's overvalued. It's like, well, it doesn't, you, know, you can't look at the businesses that way. You have to look at recurring you know, revenue, recurring expenses. You have to look at the business a different way. And those of you that are really IPO'd, right, you know that Wall Street sometimes has a hard time with your business model. The world of finance is completely broken today. It's completely broken today because of the shift to the subscription economy, and we think it's time to fix it. We think it's time to fix it. So for our first announcement today, we're announcing a new product we call Z Finance. It's the world's first finance application built for the subscription economy. It's, it provides all those things that are the fundamental problems of your traditional double entry bookkeeping system, right? It's as a time-based ledger. So when you put $30,000 in deferred revenue, it's not called deferred revenue, it's just called revenue. We spread it all out, and then we track how much is deferred and how much is recognized at any given time. It has intelligent algorithms, because it knows. It knows when you're setting up your charge models and your prices catalog, you know what's a one-time fee and what time is a recurring fee, and the system knows that. The system can match it. It has a different data model that allows you to calculate things like MRR and ACV and TCV and, and ARR, right? And it has a powerful rules engine that you can set up. The same rules engine that allows us to, to, to take billing and spread that over time, to allow you to do a $30,000 contract and say, you know, I want to bill $7,500 a quarter. Fundamentally, it's the same rules engine that allows us to do, say, you know, for revenue, though, spread it out over 12 months at $2,500 a month, right? The rules are different, but the fundamental technology is really the same. And so Z Finance is our brand new product. It comes with accounting close tools, right, so that we do 80% of the heavy lifting for your accounting close, and we give you fantastic tools to do the last 20%. You're gonna see more of it later today. Revenue recognition tools. 
right? Basically handled basic deferred revenue off of billings or really complicated deferred revenue, or revenue recognition rules and multi-element this and, and, and FASB that, and you're gonna hear more about that today. Chart of accounts. We don't reproduce it, we take it from your accounting system, we put it into our system, we tag everything with chart of accounts, and at the end of the day, we can actually flow everything back into your general ledger, back into your balance sheet, all because of our ability to synchronize with your financial system. Easy accounting integration, so at the end of the month, we produce these nice little journal entries, right? So in accounting integration back into your accounting system, be it QuickBooks, be it NetSuite, be it Intac, be it Workday, be it Financial Force, be it Great Plains, becomes really, really easy. And then tight security controls, so you can lock down accounting periods. You can control who can reopen it. You have all the auditing information that your auditors need, right? Because now that all your invoices might not be in your accounting system, you gotta put your auditors in front of our application, and we give them all the other things they need to have really, really quick audits to, uh, for audit peace of mind. Z Finance is our first announcement today. So, Z Finance tames your revenue recognition process, right? Upgrades, downgrades, cancellations. It's easy to build rules to define what happens to all these, all these newer subscription economy order types, subscription economy transactions. ViewQuest, the fourth largest telecom company in Singapore says, we use SAP, we run our broadband business on Zora, right? We get all our general entries, and it's much, much easier for now for, uh, for us to manage these businesses. Z Finance unburns your finance team, so they no longer have to say no, they can say yes to the business. We can support the business, we can support the business's growth objectives. Unleash your growth strategies without burdening finance. Auto says, Tass says, Z Finance makes it easier for us to scale as our business grows. Z Finance also gives you audit peace of mind. So you can rapidly review any transaction from any closed accounting period. You can close them, you can reopen them, full control over your accounting periods, full control over all your transactions to give you audit peace of mind. Firehost has been a long time customer. They've been using Z Billing, they've been Z using, using Z Commerce, and now they've been using Z Finance, and they're telling us that this stuff is fantastic. The stuff has been in our customers' hands. We're announcing it today, but we've been running a pilot program for Z Finance for the last four months. There's about a dozen or so customers that have been using it. If you look at what they've been doing, they've created over 300 accounting periods, over five million transactions that are analyzed on so invoices, payments, refunds, credits, all these things that sit and fall inside of an accounting period. They've closed 270 of these accounting periods. If you do the math, 15 customers, four accounting periods, how do we get to 300? Well, they've actually gone backwards. They've actually gone backwards and, and, and recreated their previous accounting periods and closed those off as part of testing our system, and the system is really, really well tested at this point. So Z Finance, our first break announcement, something we're really, really excited about. Congratulations to the entire Z Finance product and engineering team for this innovation. We're really, really excited about this. So in context, we have three applications now. In 2008, when we launched the company, we launched it with our first product, Z Billing. Right, this is what we did in 2008. Everything you need to automate your billing and payment processes in the subscription economy, whether you have three customers, 3,000 customers, three million customers, or more. Two years later, we follow up with Z Commerce. You're gonna hear a little bit more about this, right? But commerce, it turns out in the subscription economy is very, very different. It's about building relationships. We call it relationship commerce. And we launched a product in 2010 to really address this need. And today, we're here to announce our third application, Z Finance, to really unburden the finance operations of the finance department in the subscription economy. Z Billing, Z Commerce, Z Finance are our three applications. And that leads us to our second big announcement. Our second big announcement. And our second big announcement doesn't start 500 years ago. Our second big announcement starts today. And it doesn't start with our friend Luca Pacioli. It starts with you. It starts with you. It starts with our customers. And what you tell us when we talk to you is that you tell us, you know, we buy into the vision. We see it. We see it in our businesses. We see it in our customers. We see it in how we, how we manage our business on a day-to-day -day basis. We believe in the subscription economy. We believe that the future is not about focus on product, but on focus on building valuable relationships. But, you know, this stuff is not easy. It all sounds easy in the beginning. How hard could $10 a month be? How hard can $50 a user a month be? It all sounds really, really easy. But as we see the subscription economy, there's a lot of things that are just really, really difficult about running these businesses, right? And that's what you tell us. If you look at all the stuff you tell us, it really falls into three buckets. It falls into, you know, it's really, really hard to grow these businesses. I have all these ideas, all these strategies, you know, but, but, but they're all different. They're all very different than how you grow a product business. And you tell us, you know, I got orders and invoices and they're flowing everywhere. You know, I, I've got broken processes and it's hard to get my company to flow. So even if I'm growing really, really well, 
right? It's really hard to get my company to flow as I grow. Or you say, I can't get the information that I need. I know I need this piece of information, but I can't seem to find it. I don't know. I don't know the things that I really need to know. Well, why is that? Why is it so hard to run these businesses? Well, because it's different. Because this whole idea of changing the focus of your company from a product to a relationship, this has fundamental and profound changes on your company overall. If your goal of your company is not to ship more units, if the goal of your company is now is to build valuable relationships, right? That is at the fundamental core of your business in your business model. Everything changes. Everything changes. Let's look at some of these changes. We'll look at three. The first one. Well, it turns out the strategies, your company's strategy of how to grow, your fundamental strategy is probably very, very different than a product company. In a product company, if the goal is to ship as many units as you can, this is what you do. You create a killer product. You buy a big factory, make sure you can make as many of these units as you can, right? And the more you believe in it, the more you'll spend to drive down the marginal cost per product. And then you try to sell as many units as you can, right? You put it in the store shelves. You give it to the hands of your resellers. You put it to in, 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 in the warehouses of your distributors. You give it to your sales force. You try to sell as many of these units as you can, and hopefully you killed it, you built a killer product, and your Motorola, you launch the Motorola Razor, and your stock price goes through the roof. And then what happens? And then you've got to go back to the drawing board and try to come up with a Razor 2, right? And it's not always that easy. I mean, we can't all be Apple. We can't all have kid products, right? But a fundamental goal of a product business is to create a, create a killer product and ship as many of these units as, as you can, and that's how you grow. That's how you grow your business. Well, in a subscription-based business, when it's all about the relationship, when it's all about building valuable relationships, you actually have three fundamental ways of growing your business, just to simplify it all. You either acquire new customers, Right? So I have a million subscribers today, I'm trying to get to a million and a half. I've got 500 customers today, I'm trying to get to 1,000. You increase the value per customer, so my customers today are worth $30,000, and I want to see if I can move it to $40,000. I get about $50 a month from every one of my subscribers, and I think I can launch some new products and push that over to $60. Right? ARPU, average customer value, right? MRR per customer. Or you reduce churn. Right? And sometimes you wake up and you say, you know, it's actually easier for me to grow my business by reducing the people that are leaving, right, preventing them from leaving, churn defense, if you will, as it is to acquire new customers. These are the fundamental three things right, that you can do. It's not about shipping units anymore. Everything you're doing probably falls into one of these three categories, whether you're launching your first product, right, whether you're scaling your business, you're trying to get from point A to point B, whether your business is stalled out a little bit, right, growth is starting to slow and you're trying to find new markets to go into, or you're under a competitive or market threat. Right, that you've got to respond to. It's all going to be about these three things if you're a subscription economy business. Well, we spoke with you, and we inventoried about 12 different growth strategies that you do. Right? Anything from launching the first product, to introducing add-on options, to having different payment methods, monthly and annual options, higher additions, lower additions, bundling your products together, right? perhaps even through acquisitions, coming with new pricing tiers so you can get customers in easy and move them up just like the cell phone companies do, right? usage plans, overage plans, multiple currencies for an international expansion, a focus on renewals and, and reducing churn, pricing changes, introduce regional pricing or discriminatory pricing across your different segments. They, these are the fundamental strategies that help you acquire new customers, increase the value of customers, and reducing churn. So you can see at the core of all your growth strategies, at the core of all your growth strategies is one thing. It's pricing and packaging innovation. Pricing and packaging innovation is at the heart of your growth strategies in the subscription economy. And that's why if you look at the pricing plans of a Salesforce.com, a Netflix, a phone company like an AT&T Wireless, a Zipcar, right, completely different industries, completely different companies, completely different services, but their pricing plans are all starting to look the same. Silver, gold, platinum, professional and enterprise with all these different fees. It's because pricing and packaging is at the heart of growing a subscription economy business. And that's why you're in pain, because your existing systems cannot support the pricing and packaging strategies that you need to grow. And oftentimes, the first time we talk to you, this is the topic that's on your mind. Strategies are different. Let's look at processes. Processes. Well, it turns out that the processes required to make a subscription business flow are very, very different as well. In a traditional business, the term that comes to mind is quote to cash. Quote to cash is the fundamental business operations flow, if you will, for a product-based business. 
Well, in a subscription-based business, there's all these new processes that are introduced. You didn't have renewals processes before. You didn't have to deal with you know, high volume payment failures before. You didn't have to deal with account suspensions. They're not paying and they're still using the service, so I gotta figure out, you know, do I cut them off now? Do I save it for six months? Do I let them back, right? Amendments to the original subscription, upgrades, downgrades, you know. Account management, you know, you have to store all their credit card numbers on file now and you gotta let them modify it and let them change it and, 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 and store it all in a PCI compliant way. There's all these new processes that are introduced as a subscription economy business. But that's not all, that's not all. In the old business, if you look at the simple quote to cash process, it's a simple process. It's a very linear process, right? You know, your commerce system, your billing systems, your finance systems, you booked your order in the commerce system, maybe it was a quote, it's essentially an order, you ship the product, you translate that order into an invoice, it's a one-to-one -one relationship between an order and an invoice, right? You collect for it, and then you translate that invoice to revenue, and you recognize the entire invoice amount then and there. It's a linear process, it's very simple, and they're discrete processes that are independent. But in a subscription economy business, it's not that simple. It's not that simple. You can have a single order that creates multiple invoices, right? Here's an order for a three-year contract. I want to be billed monthly. There's like 36 invoices that have to go out. Or you can have an invoice that generates multiple revenues. Well, I send an invoice for a service period that covers four and a half months, so I've got to recognize the revenue over five different accounting periods, including one partial accounting period, right? It's very, very different. Or you get multiple orders that create an invoice. You do monthly invoicing, and the customer's made multiple changes during that month. You gotta consolidate what that all means to send out an invoice, right? Or you invoice annually, but they did five different amendments, and at the end, you gotta co combine all these orders to create a renewal invoice to figure out what's going on. And so there's orders and invoices and revenues that are all spanning, they're all moving around, right? And it's, it's a very, very complex world. And so, this is how you normally deal with it. What are you looking at here? This is how NetSuite proposes you deal with adjustable contracts or amendments, right? You got a sales order, it goes to subscription, it goes to multiple invoices, then you have a second sales order and you got to deal with the compensation, and then you have a revenue contract and you got to go back and redo the revenue contract. I mean, the flows just make your head hurt to figure out how the interactions between multiple orders and multiple invoices and multiple revenue contracts go. It really doesn't make any sense. It really doesn't make any sense. I mean, what you really need is you really need this concept of a subscription. You need to really wrap around your whole quote to cash process and all the other processes around the concept of the relationship, the subscription. The subscription is nothing more than the dollars and cents of the relationships. And what this allows you to do is as your commerce processes are churning, as you're doing multiple orders, you don't have to worry about the downstream impact. The orders just say, give me five more seats. This customer ordered five more seats and you don't have to think about the downstream invoicing implications. You don't have to think about the downstream revenue implications. When you send out an invoice for $30,000 and you collect for it or maybe you write it off, you don't have to worry about revenue recognition. You don't have to worry about orders. Invoices are just handling what's, 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 what's logged in that customer subscription. Orders are just man managing, manipulating the customer subscription. And then finance and revenue recognition just takes the information and knows what to deal with it. The reason you're in pain is that your systems today aren't built around this concept of a customer, customer subscription that synchronizes all the activities across orders, invoices, and revenue, and all those activities are all in the service of building valuable relationships. And so today, nope, now they're all spinning. And so today, your existing systems can't support the processes you need to make your business flow. No deals. So we looked at strategies, we looked at um, processes. Well, it turns out your fundamental business model is different, and that has vast implications of what you need to know as a business. That has vast implications of what you need to know as a business. And here is a traditional income statement, right? This is the representation of the traditional product business. It tells you that, you know, perhaps I, I shipped 20 units at $5 each last year, and I made $100. And through cost allocation, you know, it cost me $30 to really make that $100. So my gross profit is $70. And then I spent $20 in sales and marketing. I've got $10 in overhead, right? And I reinvested $20 in R&D. And so my net income is $20. We're all familiar with this. It's a, it's, a, it's a traditional income statement. But if you run your business, if you run your business, you know that the great thing about subscription-based based business is you don't have to look at revenue. You've got this thing called ARR, or annual recurring revenue, which means when you start the year, and you're trying to get to call it $150 in revenue, you don't start from zero. You don't start from zero. Right? You don't have to chase all $150. You know you have a customer base, you have contracts, you have known churn rates and known renewal rates. You actually start your business with a known ARR, and it's a much better 
it's a much stronger and much simpler and predictable way to run your business. But the income statement doesn't really help. And so we would like to introduce a brand new concept called the subscription economy income statement. That's a very different take on an income statement. It doesn't start with revenue, backwards looking revenue, it starts with forward looking ARR. Right? And so in this model, you say, well, I start the business at $100, I can bank that I will make $100 this year. Well, not exactly, right? Because you have a little bit of churn. In this model, we have a $10 churn, a 10% churn. So I can bank on $90. And then I got a service of $90, right? You know, customers are using my service, and I spent $20 on COGS to service them, $10 in overhead, $20 in R&D to produce more things that they want because it's a long-term relationship. I have a recurring profit of $40. And then I can decide, well, what do I want to do with that $40? Do I want to bank it all, or do I want to grow? And in this model, we decided to grow. We invested all $40 in growth, and we had a one-to-one -one efficiency, so we get $40 back for that, and we're able to increase our ARR from $100 to $130, so next year, if it all goes well, right, next year, I can start with an even bigger base and have an even bigger base to run the business. This is the subscription economy business model. This is a subscription economy income statement. This is probably how you guys run your business on your budgets and your operating plans for the year. It's completely different than the backwards looking income statement. Now, when you look at these, there's three key metrics that you need. If you simplify it all, you should simplify all your metrics, they likely roll up into one of these three metrics. There's a retention rate, there's a recurring profit margin, and there's a growth efficiency index. How much of the AR do you keep? How much do you spend? can you spend on, on growth once you service the customer base? And when you spend on growth, how much do you get for that? These three metrics, we believe, are the key foundation for the entire subscription economy. Retention rate, recurring profit margin, and growth efficiency. And if you're running a subscription-based business and you just tell me what these three metrics are, I've got a pretty good sense of how you're running your business. But here's the problem. Here's the problem. Your existing systems don't have the metrics that you need to know, right? Your existing systems don't have these metrics that you need in order to run your business. And so what you need, what you need is you need a system that helps you grow, flow, and no, you need a very different system to help you grow, flow, and know in the subscription economy. And that system, it's not your CRM application. Your CRM application is really, really good. It's your CRM application is what you use to manage your customer relationships, right? It's to put your sales, marketing, support, maybe your entire company on one page with respect to the customer so they can share information about the customer as they go about their activities. Your CRM, app CRM application is good. If you're here this week, it's probably Salesforce. Your GL is good. Again, it hasn't changed. Double entry booking happens, hasn't changed for 500 years. It's not going away, right? You still need financial statements. You still need auditors, right? And so your GL is perfectly good at doing what it does. What's missing today is your ERP application. Your ERP application is the application that's preventing you from growing, flowing, and knowing in your business. And so, if you believe that we're changing from a world of products to a world of relationships, that the focus for your company is no longer on the products, Certainly you have products, but the focus on the company is not, you know, it's not to, 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 to ship as many products, as many units as possible, but it's to build valuable relationships. If you believe this, then enterprise resource planning has to change. Because it's no longer about the resources, it's about the relationships. And we got up here last year, and that's what we said. We said ERP is obsolete. ERP does not help you, does not take you into the future. ERP does not go to where your company wants to go. But we didn't say, well, what replaces it? What does it have to become? And we're here today for our second big announcement. That what the world needs is they need a new system that we're gonna coin relationship business management. It's no longer about resources, it's about the relationship. It's not CRM, right? CRM is about managing your customer relationship. Relationship business management is about, is about managing the business aspect of your relationship, the dollars and cents of your relationships which is the core of your subscription economy business model. And so we're here today to announce the world's first relationship business management system. The first system for subscription economy companies to run their businesses on, and we're calling it Z-Business. Z-Business is the world's first relationship business management system. Z-Business unifies the world of commerce, it unifies the world of billing, and it unifies the world of finance, so that all three applications work in a seamless way all in the service of building customer relationships or building valuable relationships, right? It's got the pricing models that you need. It's got the data model that you need. It allows commerce and billing and finance to work as a unified whole 
for you to build and manage relationships. The commerce module, you're gonna see more about this later on. Z Business solves your relationship commerce needs. It all starts with commerce, it all starts with pricing and packaging, how you engage with your customers over a customer life cycle. Z Business will solve your relationship commerce needs. Z Business contains all the tools that you need to, 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 to automate your billing and payment processes, okay? And Z Business uh, revolutionize, revolutionizes your finance operations. Just a quick note, the confidence monitor is one slide off, behind. But in Z Business will revolutionize your finance operations and so that your finance operations is not suffering from the shift to the subscription economy. Z Business, as a unified whole, plugs into your CRM application and it plugs into your GL application because your commerce starts in your CRM. It starts with your leads, it starts with your opportunity management, it starts with your quotes, but you've got to flow it all through your day-to-day -day operations all the way into the GL. Z Business is what helps you grow, flow, and know in the subscription economy. And this is our mission. We got together as a company earlier this year and we said, what is our mission? What is our fundamental mission statement? And we decided that our mission statement is to help our customers grow, flow, and know. Every employee in the company, from me on down, we define our jobs in such a way that helps you, our customers, grow, flow, and know, because this is what it's about in the subscription economy, from the products that we build, from the customer interactions that we do, from the support that we offer you, and the best practices that we share. Our company is all about helping you help grow, flow, and know in the subscription economy.